It's like being a lavatory attendant. It stinks, but somebody has to do it. What on earth am I talking about, my darlings? Well, after the war, it's over. That's how a Soviet double agent in Britain will describe spying on his countrymen. Moscow and London may be allies, but the NKVD employs plenty of lavatory attendants. Today, we're going to talk about the most famous of them all, Kim Philby and the Cambridge Five. Before we start the show, here's a word from our sponsors. The Nazis hate them. Learn the secrets of history. Join the Time Ghost Army. Hello, darlings. This is Spies and Ties, a series of World War II in real time, and I am Astrid Deinhardt. Born in British India in 1912, Harold Adrian Russell Philby is known by his nickname Kim. Kim is a product of the Anglo-Indian elite and was educated at the finest British institutions, first Westminster School and then an economic degree at Cambridge University. Despite his upper-class upbringing, Philby believed that the rich had for too long exploited the poor. By the time he arrived at Cambridge in 1929, he was a supporter of the Labour Party. But when Labour suffered a landslide defeat in 1931 general election, Fulby lost his faith in mainstream socialism. He began looking for a more radical alternative, and by 1933 he had become a devoted communist. <laughs> Who would have thought? He also believed that communism was the only force seriously opposing the fascist surge. Philby was part of a group of Marxists at Cambridge in the 30s. I'll introduce the cast to you now. First up are two of Philby's friends. Donald McLean, who studied modern languages, and Guy Burgess, who studied history. In turn, Guy Burgess was friend with Anthony Blunt, who studied art history. Finally, there was John Kane Cross, another language student. He knew the others, but they weren't really friends. Unlike them, he was from a working class background. They will become the Cambridge Five. And it wasn't just the students. Kim's economic tutor, Maurice Dobb, here he is, no, here he is, uh, was a member of the Communist Party. His home was known as the Red House for the meetings held there, you know, Red for Communists. Upon graduation in 1933, Kim asked Dobb how best to devote his life to the Communist cause. Dobb pointed his student to Vienna, where things were heating up between the left and the right. Kim played a minor role in the Austrian Civil War as the Social Democrats and Communists fought the fascist leader Engelbert Dollfuss. Dollfuss was victorious by uh, February 34, and Kim had to leave the country. You can watch our Between Two Wars video for more on that conflict. It's very interesting. Go and have a look later on. Okay. But listen to me now. It wasn't for naught, though. Kim brought with him a wife, Alice Friedman, or Litzy. Here she is. Litzy knew the chief NKVD recruiter in the UK, Arnold Deutsch, codenamed Otto. And here he is. He was a Viennese Jew who had fled the Nazis. His main interests were communism and sex. He believed that good sex made for good revolutionaries, while sexual repression led to fascism. Mm. Okay, his job was to recruit graduates from top universities like Oxford and Cambridge. These universities churn out the ruling class of Britain. 
Just think of the access the NKVD could have with a few men like Philby in their pocket. So, in June 1934, Deutsch recruited Philby, giving him the code name Sonny. The NKVD wanted Kim to access circles sympathetic to fascism and Nazism. Deutsch advised Philby that journalism was his way in, but Philby needed to blend in. So he dropped his communist views and adopted hard right wing views, you know, as a cover up and even separated from Nitzi. Philby quickly rose through the ranks of various newspapers. His family's connection helped. He spent some time at the Anglo-German Trade Gazette and joined the Anglo-German Fellowship. This gave access to British Nazi sympathizers. His star turn was reporting for the Times during the Spanish Civil War. He was attached to Franco's forces and impressed the general with his bravery. So, listen up. In summer 1940, Kim was reporting in France. He escaped back to England in the nick of time. By this point, he had decided that he must join the intelligence services. He saw that as the best way to get hold of information for Moscow. His friend Guy Burgess was also working for SOE and was also already on the NKVD payroll. Philby had introduced him to Otto back in 35. So, with Burgess' recommendation and some help from journalistic contacts, Philby quickly finds his way into SOE. His other Cambridge friends have also embedded themselves. Burgess had already recruited Anthony Blunt at MI5. Donald McLean has been spying on the Foreign Office since 34. And Kane Cross found his way into the NKVD via the Communist Party of Great Britain. Now he's working at the Cabinet Office, which gives him access to senior government ministers. What can you say? Philby sets out to climb the greasy pole. The more senior the position, the better he can help Moscow. Philby fits in well with the upper class people from intelligence and the military that he rubs shoulder with. Many of them are the product of Cambridge or Oxford too. While off duty, Philby Burgess and Blunt spend their time at intelligence service parties where Philby does the rounds, striking up conversations and topping up glasses. His charm offences quickly pay off with Major Felix Cogill. Cogill is head of MI6 counter espionage department. Hmm. Section 5. Section 5 obtains information on enemy intelligence operations abroad and advises MI5 on how these might threaten the UK. Until quite recently, Section 5's bandwidth had been taken up with a threat from communism. That made sense. I mean, as recently as 1940, Britain was seriously considering war with the Soviet Union. Right? But now, after June 41, Britain and the Soviet Union are allies. Section 5's new focus is on Axis espionage. The Iberian Peninsula is of particular interest. We've spoken before about that secret battle going on in Spain and Portugal, right? Cowgill searching for a head for his Iberian section. Who better? than a Spanish Civil War legend. So Philby moves over to Section 5 from SOE. Mr. Philby seems to work very hard indeed. That's hardly surprising, is it? He's working two jobs. Every evening, he takes home a briefcase of telegrams and files and spends hours copying the information out. He passes on detailed descriptions of the personnel aims and operations of Section 5 to his NKVD handler. This will tot up to almost 1,000 
documents. That's a lot of copying to do. Okay, but Moscow aren't entirely happy with their pet traitor. Elena Morishinskaya, here she is, is head of the British Department, head of the NKVD Moscow headquarters, Moscow Center. She can't believe the quantity and quality of the material that Philby's forwarding. How could the British give a known communist access to all this information? Mm -hmm. That smells a bit. She's convinced that Philby is a triple agent, part of a British deception plot. And the material Kim's sending over isn't what Moscow wants. Modrachinskaya doesn't care about Iberia or eternal details of Section 5 and MI6. The Soviets are as paranoid about their allies as their enemies, and she really wants detail of British spies on the Soviet Union. The information she wants is held in the MI6 Central Registry. It's a bit like a big library, which holds details of all the agents who have ever spied for Britain. Names, code names, operations, payments, you name it, it's there. The chief register is a big drinker. So Philby lubricates him with gin and blacks his way in. The registrar doesn't even scratch his head to wonder why Philby, who works on Iberian operations, wants information on the Soviet Union. The registry reveals that MI6 has exactly zero spies in the Soviet Union. Neither are any Soviet citizens working for MI6 within the Soviet Union. The MI6 chief in Moscow has recruited nothing more than a few minor Polish informants. The USSR is a lowly tenth on the list of British priorities. You'd think that the Soviet would be relieved, right? Would they? But not really. They react with a mix of paranoia. What if it's all a trick? And wounded pride. How can the great Soviet Union only be 10th? Modrachinskaya is convinced that Philby is lying. It doesn't matter that Anthony Blunt at MI5 later confirms the report. That just puts him under suspicion too. Other spies are having a bit more luck. Unlike Philby and Purges, John Cain Cross is distinctly lacking in social graces and manages to be off-putting to almost all his colleagues. That doesn't hold him back as a spy, though. In 42, he moves from his job in the cabinet office to Bletchley Park. Here, Alan Turing and the Codebreakers read German military and diplomatic enigma messages. This information is codename Ultra, and it's some cracking stuff. The British are worried that if they reveal this secret to Stalin, the Soviets will slip up and give the game away to the Germans. So, when they share bits of Ultra with Stalin, they disguise the source, attributing it to unspecified agents within Germany. The problem is, Stalin doesn't trust these vague sources, so it's Kane Cross' job to smuggle out as many raw decrypted messages as he can. Then, he takes the train from Bletchley to London, and hands them over to his NKVD contact. Some of his intel really makes a difference. Right now, July and August 43, the Soviets are holding back the German at Kursk. The British had given Stalin intelligence pointing to a German buildup back in June 
uh, 43, right? But it was only when King Cross smuggled out the raw German language versions of these de decrypts that Stalin was convinced of the authenticity. Meanwhile, Philby has moved up in the world again. So where did he move to? He's now in charge of counter-espionage in North Africa and Italy. Hmm? Who would have thought he's ecstatic at the new opportunities this will give him to serve the Soviet Union and communism? But these promotions only heighten Modrachinskaya's paranoia. Later this year, in 43, she will even put Philby and Blunt under NKVD surveillance. So, you can see where she's coming from though, right, can't you? Philby and his friends were well-known communists at university. Not only that, but Philby's still technically married to Litzy, who is a communist and an NKVD operative. Yet Philby and the Cambridge Five escape suspicion. There are a few reasons for this. The first is that the resources directed towards searching for communist infiltration are tiny. The British are much more concerned about German agents. We've spoken about the Inter-Service 20 Committee whose job is hunting down and turning German spies. Perhaps, even more importantly, it's because the Cambridge Five went to the right schools and universities. They know the right people and speak the right way. The security services are an old boys club and men like Philby will always be accepted. You know, if you go to the right clubs, that's not a problem. Back in 41, Cowell questions Philby's father about his son's communist leaning at Cambridge. The response, ah, oh, that was all schoolboy nonsense. You know how it is in that age. He's a reform character now. Cowgill apparently swallowed that. It's not like the British are unaware of Soviet espionage. When Guy Little, head of MI5 counter espionage, unravels a communist cell within the air ministry, he writes in his diary, penetration of the services by the Communist Party is becoming rather serious. But they aren't aware of the true scale of the problem and they have to tolerate it to a certain degree. Hmm? After the war, a future head of MI5 will write that Soviet infiltration was an unfortunate but necessary cost of doing business with Stalin. Talk about a toxic relationship, eh? <laughs> Despite his father's assurance, Philby is by no means reformed and he's only getting warmed up for communism. Right now, the damage that Philby and his friends are doing to Britain is limited. Like I've said, Moscow Center simply refuses to believe a lot of their reports. In cases where the five do make a difference, most of the information they give to Stalin isn't directly harmful to British interest. Look at Kursk, for example. King Cross certainly risked the secret of uh, Ultra, but he was only confirming info that the British had already given. Donald McLean sends over some rich diplomatic stuff. Britain's desire for post-war Poland and FDR and Churchill's thought on the coming invasion of Europe. This helped Stalin get the edge on his Western counterparts during negotiations, but doesn't really affect the war itself. All this changes, though. If you'll permit me to look a little bit into the future, by the summer of 44, Elena Modrysinskaya will have retired. Moscow Center will look back at the information the five have supplied and the loyalty they have shown and will decide that they are great value.
Why then? As thoughts turn to the post-war world, MI6 will have established a new counter-espionage section dedicated to the threat from the Soviet Union, uh, from the Soviet Union, sorry, and communism. And who's in charge? It will be none other than Kim Philby with King Cross working under him. Donald McLean will take up an important position in Washington and will leak the Western atomic secrets. The Foxes will be in charge of the hen house. Philby and the Cambridge Five will become the most notorious double agents in modern history. They will be responsible for the death of countless British and American agents and they'll get away with it all. Naughty devils. If you'd like to learn more about Soviet double agents, then click here to watch Indie Talking about Richard Zorge. To get ever more content like this, join the Time Ghost Army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. Until then, until then, love your life, love your family, love your pets and I. We'll see you next time. Daleks. Mm -hmm.